Bridget Mendler living on a high wire here on 92.1 WGHN-FM, Grand Haven. And a very good Wednesday afternoon to you here, everybody. This is Afternoons with Jesse on Game 7 of the World Series. And I told you at the outset of the show that I had a real treat for you folks. And uh, it's a little bit of history that you probably would not have heard if it were not for the efforts of uh, my dear friend here on the phone. We have Mr. Mike Secory on the blower. Can you hear me, Professor? I can. How are you doing, Jesse? I'm doing just fine, just fine. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for unearthing this little bit of history here, because uh, this is, I mean, you found something from a defunct radio network. I don't know how you got a hold of it. You can share the story <laughs> with us here in a second, but I'm, I'm going to kind of set the scene here. Um, and now this is my understanding. You had an uncle named Frank, correct? Yes, yeah, right. All right. And what was Frank C. Corey's claim to fame? Well, golly, you know what, Jesse, I think he had uh, more than one claim to fame. Uh, he was, uh, some, some of the older baseball fans might remember a few of these things. He was one of the umpires way back in 1959 when uh, Harvey Haddix of the Pittsburgh uh, Pirates pitched a perfect ball game for 12 innings. 12 innings, perfect game, and then he finally lost the game one to nothing in the 13th inning, but he t- pitched 12 innings of of perfect ball. Mm-hmm. He was also umpire when Jim, one of the umpires when Jim Bunning threw a perfect ball game for Philadelphia in 1964. He umpired nine official no hitters. He uh, umpired in uh, four different World Series. Uh, he did. He umpired in a bunch of All Star games as well. Uh, and so you know he's in four halls of fame. Muskegon Area Sports Hall of Fame, the Western Michigan uh, University Hall of Fame, the Port Huron Hall of Fame, and back in 2008, I'm proud to say that he was inducted one of the first inductees into the Grand Haven Schools Foundation Halls of Fame. Mm-hmm. So he's uh, he's been around. He's done some great things. Well, before he was an umpire, he yes. played Major League Baseball. And yes, he did. And I remember, you, yeah, I, 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 I get this is so good, we both want to jump in on it. Okay, so you sent me this clip. Explain who he played for and kind of his significance in history because of what's going on tonight. Well, just a quick history. He was a Grand Haven High School graduate, uh, Jesse, back in the early 1930s. He played both baseball and football at Grand Haven. Then he went to uh, Western, which was called Western Teachers College, I think, back then. He graduated from Western in 1936. He played, actually, both football and baseball at Western in college, too. So uh, that was quite a thing. But So then in 1936, when he graduated, he was uh, drafted by the uh, Detroit Tigers, actually, uh, where he played in, golly, he played with the Detroit Tigers in 1940, and then he was dealt to Cincinnati in 1941, and then he played there for a couple of years. He ended up his career. Uh, and that's why we're talking about him now mainly, is uh, he played with the Cubs from 1944 to 1946. And the big thing, of course, is that in Game 6, with the score tied 7-7, they were playing the Detroit Tigers in game numbers in the World Series, Frank, uh, he was mainly a pinch hitter. And, Jesse, he was a real good pinch hitter because he didn't strike out very much. So he was used mainly as a pinch hitter with the Cubs. But he came up to bat. Late in the, in the 12th inning, actually, with the score tied 7-7, uh, and he got a single with one out in that 12th inning. Uh, I believe that they put a pinch runner in for him, but his run then, his pinch runner's run, scored on a uh, double that was hit uh, a little while later to give the Cubs uh, an 8-7 to win in 12 innings and tied the series and sent it to the seventh game. All right, so then this is where I come in on the story because of this audio clip you sent me. All right. Um, That's actually, actually, Jesse, the, the audio clip that you're going to play now is actually in the next game, in the last game. That's right. The seventh game, the next, the next day. That's yeah. right. I, I, I looked it up here. Okay. Um, this is audio from, because normally if we, we have to give credit to the organization. Well, these people aren't around. it. This is from the Mutual Broadcasting System and Mr. Bill Slater is on the call. Uh, This is from Wednesday, October 10th, 1945, Game 7. And and I I notice they don't say Secori, they say Secori here. Well, (laughs) it's really funny because uh, Peggy and I are are a couple of uh, a few people who say 
see Corey yet, yeah. but uh, my brother and my uncles and nephews and almost everybody else in the family says to Corey. Yeah. All right. So anyway, here we go. All right. So this okay. is we're we're going into uh, this is late in the game. This is game uh, game seven for Wrigley Field. Uh, like I said, Wednesday, October tenth, nineteen forty five, and Mr. Frank Secorey, your uncle, is coming in to square off with eventual Hall of Famer Hal Newhouser. Here we go. Courtesy of our friends at the Mutual Broadcasting Network. I believe that's the first walk today given up by Newhouser. And here comes Frank Sicori up to be a pinch hitter. Sicori's coming up as a pinch hitter. This will be the fifth game in which Sicori has been used as a pinch hitter. And he has had two hits out of four times up. That gives him as a pinch hitter a 500 batting average, which is nothing to be sneezed at. Now there are cup runners at first and second. There's only one out, and Sikori, a right-handed batter, is standing in there. There's a curve that comes in and over for a called strike. Sikori's a big athlete, the great big number 49 on his back. He's an outfielder. He comes from Fort Huron in the state of Michigan. He was born in Iowa. Swings, fouls it off, strike two. Newhauser in a bit of trouble here. In the last half of the seventh, he's rubbing up the new ball very carefully himself. Newhouser looked very calm and cool at breakfast this morning in the hotel. Benton and Overmeyer still working in the bullpen for the Tigers. Now Sakari is ready to go again, and Newhouser has that ball rubbed up. He has two strikes on Sakari. Now he has three strikes on him, a call third strike. That was a very, very clever curveball that Newhauser flipped in there on the 0-2 pitch, and he got Sikori, who was standing taking. That makes it two out. How about them apples? Not something you don't hear every day. <laughs> well, you know what, Jesse? Hal Newhauser, one of the best pitchers ever for the Tigers, and it, but you know what? That clip just shows you what a great guy my Uncle Frank was. Hal Newhauser, like the announcer just said, was in all kinds of trouble. And my Uncle Frank was such a great guy that he bailed him out of trouble by looking at that third strike. And there's yeah. probably some people out there that I played some baseball with, Jesse, and some fast-pitch softball in Grand Haven in my time, and are saying, yeah, he's a true seeker. He never could hit the curveball. Well, <laughs> 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 there you oh, go. Oh, what a guy. Well, uh, to kind of uh, flesh out the story here, Hal Newhauser uh, wound up in the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1992. His number 16 was retired by the Tigers. The final uh, result of that game, of course, the Tigers won Game 7 uh, on that date in, in October 10th, 1945. Final score of 9-3, to uh, and that was the last time the Cubs got anywhere near the World Series. How did you come in possession of this audio? Because, you know, the mutual broadcasting well, system hadn't been around in about 40 years. Well, you know what? It's it's kind of a mystery to me, too, Jesse. i got to be honest that we have some uh, relatives that still live in Port Huron, and uh, one of my nephews who lives there sent it to me a couple of days ago. And, uh, in fact, I just after I talked with you earlier today, I, I called him, and he said, I really don't know, and he tried to find out but could not. So not sure exactly where that came from, Jesse, but... Uh, priceless anyway it is priceless and you know the thing is when when radio networks go up because you know during the dawn of baseball there was radio networks were much bigger uh earlier in the in, in it, baseball was one of the first things that got on radio and so when these things go by the wayside you know who knows who has this stuff but the fact that there's some you know a little bit of history there and uh, hear how the call and even though the game was different back then how similar the game is today i mean even the way he told the story and the little anecdotes right. that he tosses in like you tossed in like he was you know he's a tall man and he was from iowa but he went to Port here on high school it, it, it's just it's just something you don't hear every day and it's a neat little piece of history yeah frank uh 6'1 200 pounds actually and you know when you go back into the 1930s and 1940s when he played college and then uh major league baseball that that's a pretty good size athlete 6'1 200 pounds and in fact jesse you know another a little side note to to uncle frank i said that he played football also at western michigan and uh, just, oh, I'd say maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I can't remember the exact t- a year, but he was actually voted to into the uh, all-century Western Michigan Bronco football team. 
and played way back in the 1930s in college football. And you kind of ask yourself, wow, how could a guy that played college football in the 1930s make an all-century team? You know, when you think about mm-hmm. how they play college football today, sure. how could a guy so... He must have been pretty impressive way back then. He must have been, must have been. By the way, I'm looking at the box score here. The next guy up at the top of the inning for the Tigers was Hank Greenberg. He wasn't no slouch. And no, uh, they had some players. This is also the game that the Curse of the Billy Goat originated at. So, I mean, this is just a oh. hu- huge, huge piece of, of baseball <laughs> history that just, you know, it, it just kind of stumbled in through the email. So, uh, you, you know what, Jesse? I was, I was really kind of curious to, to find out if I could. Uh, how much uh, baseball players got paid back in those days? Well, they had... And I was able, and I wasn't able to find out his exact salary, but I was able to find out uh, kind of an average uh, for the years between 1940 and 1946 when Frank played, and uh, he made some place between probably twenty-five and thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Now, you know, to some kids listening, they said, "Boy, that's a lot of money." Well. That's probably about how much a Major League Baseball player would make today yeah. every time he goes to bat. Sure, sure. Ex- yeah. uh, but you also got to look at the uh, rate of inflation back then. So twenty five grand would have been a lot back then. But Sure. Oh, oh absolutely. But yep. anyway. Uh, so uh, <laughs> now we have the, the actual World Series coming up tonight. Quickly, how do you think the, uh, the Cubs will fare, sir? Well, you know, the Detroit Tigers are my number one team, of course. They're a Michigan team. But the Chicago Cubs are close behind, and... And, you know, because of Uncle Frank and all of our ties with the family. In fact, some of those nephews that I just mentioned a while back uh, went down last weekend and, and took in a uh, game. I think it was on Sunday, the game that the Cubs won, I believe, didn't they, on mm-hmm. Sunday? They did. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, we got some ties with the Chicago Cubs, and they're not too far away. Uh, Peggy and I went down to Chicago about a month or so ago and went to the final home regular season game. They beat the St. Louis Cardinals that night. So it's just, you know, the Wrigley Field is just a great place to go watch a baseball game. There's bars all over the place, of course, but it looks like they took a big baseball stadium, Jesse, and just dropped it in the middle of a of a neighborhood. It's just a really fun place to go. Mm-hmm. And it was obviously packed, and the people just were going crazy that night. What a, what a fun night that was for Peggy and me. Mm-hmm. Indeed, indeed. Cubs play Cleveland coming up tonight at 8 o'clock. And uh, just think, if the Cubs win tonight, I'll, for everybody who got to hear this day, what a fortunate uh, little bit of uh, their time they got to spend with us here, hearing this piece of history and how ironic it would be if the Cubs can pull off a victory tonight. Quickly, Professor, uh, you're the voice of Spring Lake Sports on our sister station, Sports Radio 1370. When is your first basketball game? December 6th. Dece- uh, the Laker boys will kick off the season. The Montague Wildcats will come to Spring Lake on December the Montague Wildcats yeah, on December 6th. Looking forward to it. It should be a great season, Jesse. It should be a lot of fun. should be a lot of fun. All righty. Well, Professor, thank you very much for sharing this with us. This is a, an interesting little piece of tape, and when I, I, I've been meaning to open it, and I finally had some time today, and I heard it, and I wanted to wait and make sure the Cubs got to the seventh game. I wanted to line it up, and they did. <laughs> so uh, it was just a really neat thing we have to share with the audience, and, and I appreciate you sharing it with us, friend. Well, I thank you too, Jesse. Thank you so much. I hope everybody really enjoyed that. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye.